Dr. Michio Kaku, our homegrown genius, a producer for Pacifica Radio, to you right now. Listen to this. First of all, let me say that all these honors and accolades can backfire on you. Recently, New York Magazine had a contest. Who are the 100 smartest people in New York? Well, I'm proud to say I made the list. I'm now officially one of New York's 100 smartest people. (laughs) However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. (laughs) And next year, they told me that I'll probably get pushed off the list by Lady Gaga entirely. (laughs) Well, I'm proud to say that because of you, the listeners of KPFA Radio, because of you, the book has now hit the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you very much. It's because of you that pushed the book to the bestseller list. Now, let me say that people come up to me and say, well, what's the difference between physics and chemistry and all the other sciences? Well, let me tell you a short story. Well, during World War II, the Nazis captured a bunch of American scientists, and they called them spies, and they lined them up about to be executed by a firing squad. Well, there was a geologist, a physicist, and a chemist. Well, they put the geologist in front of the firing squad, and they asked the the geologist, do you have any last words? And all of a sudden, the geologist said, earthquake, earthquake, earthquake. Well, everyone scattered, because there's an earthquake, and then the geologist snuck away. Now it was the physicist's turn. They put him on the firing squad. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And then he said, lightning, lightning. Everyone scattered, lightning. And then the physicist snuck away. But now it was the chemist's turn. They put the chemist on the firing squad. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And the chemist said, fire. Fire! Well, wrong word there. Well, what does a physicist do anyway? Well, we like to invent things. We invent the future. We invented the transistor, which makes possible Silicon Valley, your iPhone, computers. We invented the laser. In fact, when I was at Berkeley, the guy down the hall... Charlie Towns invented the laser. And don't forget, we also created the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, physicists wrote to keep track of subatomic particles. We also invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves. In the hospital, we invented the x-ray machine. We invented the MRI scan. We invented the space program. And We physicists love to make predictions. When we helped to assemble the Internet, one physicist predicted that the Internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the Internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the Internet. Just wait until grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet, then 50% of the internet will be pornography. (laughs) Now, before I begin to give you a, a guided tour of the future, let me tell you a few things about myself. First of all, my grandparents. My grandparents came to the Bay Area 100 years ago. My grandfather was part of the cleanup operation of the San Francisco earthquake. He helped to clean up the debris from the San Francisco earthquake. So my family thrived in California, but then came World War II. And during World War II, my parents, who were U.S. citizens, got hauled off to a relocation camp. They spent the rest of the war behind barbed wires, machine guns, 
with all their assets confiscated. When the war was over, my parents were penniless. And I realized that if anything's going to happen, I'm going to have to do it myself. So one day, I went up to my mom and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt beta charge particle accelerator? And my mom kind of stared at me and said, Sure. Why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. So I took out the garbage. I went to Westinghouse. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I built an atom smasher on the football field at Coverly High School in Palo Alto, California. It consumed six kilowatts of power, generated a 10,000 Gauss magnetic field. If you were to walk by my machine, it could pull the fillings out of your teeth if you got too close. Finally, it was ready. I closed my eyes, shut my ears, and I heard this crackling sound as six kilowatts of raw power surged in my capacitor bank. And then I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as they blew out every circuit breaker in the house. My poor mom, every time I blew out the lights, she would say, where are the fuses? And then she must have said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? Maybe if I buy him a baseball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, then it was time to think about college. I got a scholarship to Harvard. And then the Vietnam War burst out into the open. I went into the United States Army. I served honorably in the United States Infantry. But I must say that in the Army, I learned a contradiction in terms. That contradiction in terms is called military intelligence. <laughs> that is a contradiction in terms. But today, I want to talk about our possible destiny in outer space. You know, many of you probably saw the movie The Martian, starring Matt Damon. Raise your hand. How many people saw the movie, <laughs> whoa, The Martian? You know, that movie cost a hundred million dollars. But the Indians sent a probe all the way to Mars for seventy million dollars. A Hollywood movie about going to Mars costs more than actually going to Mars. That's how cheap things have come since the 1960s. During the Oscars, they should give an Oscar for the best supporting spacecraft because they're simply so cheap. So cheap that last month, just last month, the Falcon Heavy rocket blasted off Cape Canaveral. How many people saw the film of the rocket blasting off Cape Canaveral? Millions saw it. Thousands. Thousands of people lined up the streets of Cape Canaveral to watch the launch of the Falcon Heavy rocket. That was no ordinary rocket. First, it was a moon rocket. NASA has always been criticized for 50 years for being the agency to nowhere. It boldly goes where everyone has gone before. Nothing new under the sun. Well... That rocket was a moon rocket that blasted off on your TV screen last month. And who paid for it? Was it the taxpayers? No. It was a private individual, Elon Musk. No, not a dime from the taxpayer. Think about that. And the rockets were reusable. Again, cutting the cost of space travel. Well, next. Elon Musk has said that he wants to create an even bigger rocket. Not just a moon rocket, but a Mars rocket. And he's called it the BFR. B for big. R for rocket. <laughs> and you can guess what the F stands for. BFR is going to take us to Mars. After a 50-year gap, we are going back to the moon. It's cheaper now. 
private enterprise is coming into game because they want to have their name put on these rockets. So we're talking about a new era in space travel. Think about that. Well, let's now talk about outer space and some of the other books I've written. Physics of the Future, my previous bestseller, also talks about the future of space travel, but also the future of medicine, cancer research, robotics, jobs. You see, I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC television, for the Science Channel, and for Pacifica Radio and KPFA Radio, my favorite radio station. <laughs> and when I interview these scientists, I always ask them one question. The question of all questions. The question that has haunted politicians and theologians and ministers and philosophers for centuries. This question is, is there intelligent life on the earth? <laughs> the answer is obviously no. Did you see the last year's presidential election? <laughs> obviously no intelligent life on this planet. Nope, no siree. And then my other book, Physics of the Impossible, I go 500 years into the future. Well, we might have time machines. We might have starships. And in this book, I answer the question, what happens if you go into a time machine and you go back, back in time, and you meet your teenage mother before you're born and she falls in love with you? <laughs> well, if your teenage mother falls in love with you before you're born, you're in deep doo-doo if that happens. And then my other book, The Future of the Mind, I talk about research being done at Berkeley, where I got my PhD years ago. Did you know now that in animals, in mice, we can actually upload memories? It's amazing, things that were considered impossible. We can upload memories and download memories. Now we're doing it with monkeys, recording simple memories in monkeys and downloading them. We do it. Next is Alzheimer's patients. We want to get memories on a chip, a brain chip. You push the brain pacemaker and memories come flooding into your mind of an Alzheimer's patient, where you live, where you work, who you are. And some people saw the movie, The Matrix, where reality itself was uploaded into your mind. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you kind of a weird question. Late at night, late at night, just before you go to sleep, have you ever had that weird feeling that maybe life is an illusion? Maybe life is an illusion that's been uploaded into your mind. You're the only real person. Come on, give me, a, give me an answer. How many of you have ever had that feeling? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Oh my God, you're crazy. <laughs> So many crazy people in this audience. How can you be the only person in the world when I'm the only person in the world? You know, I'm in bed right now in New York. I'm just dreaming. I'm sitting before this great audience because of KPFA radio. I mean, come on, give me a break. Well, let's begin our discussion by saying that the pioneers of the space age have been ridiculed, called a fraud, denied funding. This is Robert Goddard, the father of modern rocketry. The New York Times called him a fraud. They said that rockets cannot move in outer space. Therefore, all the work of this scientist is junk, said the New York Times. Well, unfortunately, he died, and then, years later, we went to the moon in 1969. At that point, the New York Times finally published a retraction and said, oops, I guess you can move in a vacuum with a rocket. Well, why did Goddard do all these things knowing that he would face ridicule? that people would laugh at them. Why, what kept him going? The answer is, as a child, 
He read a book. He read a book called War of the Worlds, and he was hooked. At that point, he said, there is life in outer space. We can go there by building these rockets. And that's what kept him going for all these years, this children's vision of going to Mars. And then I had Carl Sagan on KPFA radio. And I asked Carl Sagan, how come you became an astronomer? And he said he read John Carter of Mars. He was hooked. Mars was going to be his destiny. He was going to chase the beautiful Dejah Thoris on the sands of Mars. And then Sagan said something interesting on KPFA radio. He said, well, why should we go into outer space? Because we should become a two-planet species. And I asked him, why? Why bother? And he said, well, look, no one is saying that we should evacuate the Earth. It's impossible. You can't evacuate the Earth, go to Mars. But we need an insurance policy. Plan B, he said, a settlement on Mars. Why? Because of the fact that, well, we live in the middle of a cosmic shooting gallery. Asteroids, meteors, not to mention super volcanoes could wipe us out. And then there's another book that inspired young people. I read this book when I was a child to create a multi-planet species. And again, we don't want to run away from the problems of the Earth. We don't want to run away from the greenhouse effect. We don't want to run away from all our self-inflicted problems. No. But we need an insurance policy. And this is the rise of a galactic empire. So you see, there are many problems that we face. Natural disasters. The Earth itself will eventually be destroyed by the sun. The poets ask the question, will the Earth end in fire or ice? I know the answer. The answer is fire. The sun will eat up the earth billions of years into the future. So we have super volcanoes, we have ice ages, and realize that on the earth, 99.9% .9 of all species have gone extinct. Extinction is Mother Nature's way of cleaning shop. Dr. Michio Kaku, the brilliant... Dr. Michio Kaku, talking about his new book last night in Berkeley. Last night at the First Congregational Church of Berkeley. He was here. He's a friend. He does a program uh, on Pacifica Radio. And Dr. Kaku is an absolute genius. And his speech last night was off the charts. And it is a delight to listen to Michio. Again, I first interviewed him in 1980, an amazing colleague at WBAI, a real friend of Pacifica, and again, an incredible genius. Uh, talking about his new book, a little bit background, uh, human civilization is on the verge of spreading beyond Earth. More than a possibility is becoming a necessity. Whether our hand is forced by climate change and resource depletion or whether future catastrophes compel us to abandon Earth, one day we will make our homes among the stars. World-renowned physicist and futurist Michio Kaku explores in rich, accessible detail how humanity might gradually develop a sustainable civilization in outer space in outer space dr kaku thank you we love you mitchell